The Fashioner is a part of Patternmaker Pro. It's a very unique program built specifically to draft and manipulate sewing patterns. These patterns can be used to clothe real people or 3D characters. There are very few programs like The Fashioner and none of them, to the best of my knowledge, are browser-based and free. The Fashioner is the ultimate flat pattern drafting tool. You'll find lots and lots of pattern drafting books dating back into the 1800s and all the instructions are for using paper and pencil. The Fashioner is the 21st century replacement for that paper and pencil. In this video, I'll teach you how to use the Fashioner to create patterns for any design you can come up with. There's nothing to buy or download. The Fashioner is my gift to all of you interested in sustainable made-to-measure clothing. Before we get going, I want to mention that I'm going to use a 3D avatar in Marvelous Designer rather than a real-world dress form. I'm doing this because it's much easier than sewing in the real world. It's also much less expensive than buying yards and yards of muslin. However, this video is not about MD in any way. I'm only using it as a virtual dress form. I'm going to do all the pattern manipulation and drafting in Patternmaker Pro Fashioner. Some of you who use MD know that you can manipulate patterns in MD. That's not what this video is about. You can't output real patterns from Marvelous Designer, and I'm not promoting MD. The Fashioner produces real patterns that you can sew, and that's what this video is all about. When you visit Pattermaker Pro to get sewing patterns, many of you may be a bit disappointed. There aren't very many patterns here for you to use. There are a couple reasons for this. First, I'm the only person that's designing and creating these patterns. The process isn't quick, so it'll take me a bit of time to build this catalog up. Second, I really don't want to create a gazillion patterns for you. What would I create? Do you want dresses or pants? What length do you want? clothes for summer or for fall? You want snug knits or loose and comfortable wovens? What about cosplay? What's the current trend that everybody's looking for? As you can see, there are literally thousands of options and possibilities. There's no way that I could satisfy every need even if I had enough time to do it. That's why I created the Fashioner. With just a bit of training and a lot of encouragement, I can teach you to design anything you want. It's not that hard. There are some basic principles that you need to understand, and then you'll see just how easy this is. I'm going to teach you how to become a designer and draft real patterns that you can sew yourself. You may have noticed that the Patternmaker Pro catalog contains sloper patterns, also called basic blocks. These are the most important patterns there are. You'll want to use these to test the measurements that you've taken and make sure the fit is perfect. Once you have a well-fitted sloper, the rest will be easy. Although you can start work in the Fashioner by selecting any pattern in the Fashioner catalog, you can also start from nothing, and that's what we're going to do. I want to illustrate the power of this tool and get you acquainted with how it works. You're not limited to the slopers I have provided. You can create your own using any drafting book you can find. All of these books use the pencil and paper method. I'll show you how easy it is to convert those instructions to the Fashioner. The instructions we're going to use come from a 1942 book by Harriet Pepin titled Modern Pattern Design, The Complete Guide to the Creation of Patterns as a Means of Designing Smart Wearing Apparel. Quite the book title. I love this book, and it's chocked full of amazing design ideas. If you recall, the women's garments of the 1940s were very well fit with lots of fun design details. We'll explore some of those a bit later. Here are the measurements that are required from the book. You'll see that they're very different from the measurement sets in Pattermaker Pro. You'll find this is very common. Every drafting book has their own process involving their own required set of measurements. We'll be drafting a front bodice sloper for Grace. She's one of the default avatars in Marvelous Designer. I took Grace's measurements following the instructions in the book. If you want to follow along, I've included all this information and the MD project files on the website. Link below. Let's start the draft. So to begin, we need a blank fashioner session. 
And so we'll go into the fashioner catalog and select the blank canvas for the fashioner. And we need to select a measurement set even though we won't be using any of the standard measurements that are in it. This will set the unit that we're working in as well as some stock information like default seam allowances. So I'm going to drop down and select the grace set and that was already copied into my account out of the library. And now we can add that to the basket and then move on to the fashioner. So now we have a big blank page to work with. And as we go along, I'm going to read off the instructions from the book and then I'll show you how they translate into the fashioner. So Grace's unit selection is millimeters and I'll be working in millimeters. The book uses inches. So you'll get to see some conversions as I work. Now that we've got the fashioner open, I want to talk to you a moment about layers. And layers are an important part of the fashioner and they allow us to separate the different parts of the draft. And if I open the layers, select active layer, you can see that we have three layers under the main layer here. One for draft, outline, and text. You can tell which layer is currently active up here. So we're sitting on the fashioner draft layer. And you can think of layers as transparent pieces of paper. Anything that you draw on them, they're stacked on top of each other. So you could have something in all three layers, you would see them all, but they're still separated. I just wanted you to see that right now we're on the draft layer and I think this is a perfect layer for us to work on. The book has a nice illustration that has all the lines and points that we're going to create. So I redid it in Illustrator and I'll be referring to that as we work through the process. Now we'll follow along with the instructions in the book. And the first item, it says point A is located four inches below the top edge of the paper, one inch inward from the right margin. So we're going to create our first point just using the points tool, add free point. And I'm going to put that right here and then save and this is our point A. The next instruction is that we're going to create a point B which is equal in length to the amount of the center bodice length. If we look at the diagram we see that B is located completely vertical up point A. We can use the point add point from point tool, select point A and now we want to go down, which is the Y position, by the center bodice length. That's 357.5. And now we can see a little preview here. That looks correct, so we'll save that. The next item is from point B to point 2. And this line equals the full bodice length measurement and they talk about laying down a square and such, but we don't need to worry about that in the fashioner because everything is square if we choose it to be. So this point is located up here at the top. And again, we'll use point from point. We're going from point B. And the distance is going to be the full bodice length, just 413.2. Now notice that I'm going to put a negative on this because I want to go up. And there's the point. Let me explain why that is. This is SVG and SVG's origin point is right here in the corner. So this would be X0, Y0 right here. So when we want to go in the horizontal direction to the right, it's a positive number. If we want to go to the left, it would be negative. For the y-axis, when we want it positive, it's down. Negative would be up. So measuring from here to there, we're going up needs to be negative. And you always have your preview to make sure that you've done it correctly. And I'm going to save that. The book instructs us to draw a guideline that's 15 inches long and it's going to have points 3, 4, and 5 on it. So this is a horizontal line that's going to run through point 2 and we can do that very quickly here. We are going to select lines, reference line. 
where we'll select point two as the start and continue. This is a completely horizontal line and continue and there it is, we'll save it. For point three, we're to measure off a distance equal to one half of the across measurement. Again, we're going to use the point from point, from point two, we're going left, so that's negative on the x-axis, and the value is 148.55. And then we'll save that. Next, we're going to go off point two again, and this time it's gonna be one half the shoulder point width value. So point, point from point, point two, Again, we're going left in the x position, so that's going to be a negative, and one half the shoulder point width is 169.05. We'll save that one. And now our instructions are to measure off point two once again, and this time we are supposed to do one half of the full bodice width. That's going to be 228.2 and we can save. Now you'll notice that the points are lining up with the illustration and it's good to refer to any illustrations in these books to make sure that you're following the instructions properly. Now we need some more guidelines and these are supposed to be running off of points three, four, and five. We'll select lines, reference line, point three. This is a vertical line. And then we'll repeat that for point four. And finally for point five. So the next point we're going to make is the shoulder point, which is point six on our illustration. And this action is going to have to differ quite a bit from the instructions. If we were working with pencil and paper, we would place the end of a tape measure at point B, then we would find the shoulder pitch measurement on the tape and hold it up to the reference line number four and then rotate the tape until the measurement touched the line. And where they touched would be the point we're looking for. Now obviously we can't do that here in SVG, but we have a much easier way to do it actually. And we're going to use a circle, and the radius of that circle will match the shoulder pitch measurement. So we want to create a circle, and we're going measuring from point B. And the measurement that we want to use is that shoulder pitch measurement, which is 416.4. Once we enter the radius, it calculates the diameter and, and the circumference. We're not concerned with that at this point. This circle looks correct. So I'm going to save it. So this process is very similar to a tape. We know that from the center of this circle to the edge is that measurement all the way around. So you can imagine that we have a little tape here. And as the tape rotates over, we see where it meets this reference line number four, which is right there. So we just need to know where that intersection is. We can find the intersection and draw a point in one fell swoop here with point at a point at intersection. Now we're going to select the two elements. I'm using my scroll wheel, by the way, to zoom up. I want the circle and this reference line. It found the point, so I'm going to save that. Now I'm going to back off and show you. Because this reference line is so large, we have another point down here. 
we don't want this point and we can just quickly delete it. And there's our perfect intersection. Now, if we had any doubt about this, we know that our shoulder pitch measurement was 416.4. We can go up to utilities, distance between points. Select these two points and measure it. There you go. So you can see this circle is a great way to find a point on a line at distance. Now that we've gotten all this geometry drawn, it would be a really good time to save this because we don't want to lose any of our work. I'm just going to come up here and hit File Save. And save that. Now, the saving process within the Fashioner is quite unique and Every time you select a tool and use it and hit the Save button here in the Tool Panel, it literally saves your position. And it's cumulative and nothing gets overwritten. So at any point, you can come up here and step back and start erasing anything that you've done. By the same token, you can step forward and move forward in the file. So you will never lose any of your work. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the future, but I just wanted to bring it up at this point. Our next point is point 7. This point will be very similar to how we did the last one. We're supposed to measure off of point 6 and intersect this upper line right here by the shoulder width measurement. So we'll come up to Shapes, Add Circle, select point 6, and the shoulder width measurement we want to use is 92.5 millimeters. We'll save that. And now we can locate the point with point at intersection. Select our circle and our line, and there's our new point. Again, we got an extra one over here, so I'm going to just delete that. The instructions now ask us to create a reference line, a horizontal reference line, that's six inches long off of this point A. And we'll just come up and do another horizontal line here. The next thing we need to create is another reference line, but this is unique in that it is perpendicular to an existing line. So this line, 6 to 7, is the shoulder line, and I'm going to go ahead and draw that in just so you can see it. I'm selecting the start and end, continue, and save. Now I have no idea how long this line is. I know that we want it to intersect with this one to create a point, but I wouldn't have any way of knowing what that distance is. So what we're going to do is we will just create a point that's perpendicular, just a short distance off of here. We'll select the Add Point Perpendicular tool. Now it asks for the origin, and the origin point is where it's coming off of. So if I want a point here, it, the origin is here. If I wanted it down here, it would be there. So this is the origin. And now it asks for the point for vector. Now let me explain for a moment what a vector is. You'll see it throughout the program. A vector by definition describes the magnitude and direction of a point or a line. In this case, the vector would be the direction that this is going. So what we've told the program is we want to create a point that is perpendicular, and I've only provided it one point as the origin, so you need to tell it what's the reference. And that vector or reference point is right here. Now we continue 
and it asks for the distance. I'm just going to throw 40 in here because I don't really know how long I need it to be. And there's the point. You can see that this is 90 degrees off of this line. It's also not where I want it. I wanted it over here so I can just flip it over to the other side. And now I'll save and now I have a point that is perpendicular to this line or basically to this vector. Now I need a reference line that's going to come through here and cross over this one. And that is how we will find point 8. So I can come back up to reference lines and I'll select the starting point here. And now I'm going to say this is on a vector. If you recall, this line we did horizontal and these were vertical. Now this line obviously is not either. It's at an angle. So the vector is different than these others. We'll pick on vector. And now it says which point defines that vector. So that's going to be this one and we continue and there you see the line goes through these both points. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. Basically what it comes down to is that if you want the fashioner to make a line that's perfectly horizontal or vertical, just give it a point and it will make that line because it already knows what the vector is. It's straight across or straight up and down. If you want a line that is not perfectly straight up and down or to the side, you're going to have to tell it what those reference points are for the angle. And that's what that on vector did. We said this is the point you're going to start with, but here's the point that tells you what the angle is. So that's the vector. And you'll see this on some of the other processes as we go along. Now that we have the reference lines, we'll come up to the point tool again, add point at intersection, and I'm going to select those two lines and save, and there's point 8. The instructions now say that we're going to come off of point 6 to create point C. Point C is located 4 inches off of point 6 on the 3 reference line, which is right here. So let's go back up to our circle off of this point and 4 inches is 101.6 millimeters. Now you can see that things are starting to get just a little bit confusing here. We've got circles on circles and it might get confusing as to what we're supposed to be selecting. So there are a couple of options. One thing you can do is go ahead and delete geometry that you don't think you'll need anymore. I could get rid of this inner circle that we used here to create point 7, for example. But sometimes you don't know if you're going to need geometry again or not. And so the easiest thing to do is to just hide it. And to do that, we're going to create a new layer. I'll come up here to Layers add a layer. Now I'm already working on the draft layer so I'm going to pick the draft as the parent. And this new layer I'm just going to call it the hide layer. Now I can move some things over to that layer. Let's move this inner circle here over. So I'll come to layers, move items to existing layer, and select that circle and I want to move it to the hide layer. Now nothing really changed. It doesn't look any different just like I described before. All the layers are visible so they're just stacked on top of each other. But I can come up here to layer visibility and click hide layer and now I just hid everything that was on that layer. So I'll save that. And why don't we go ahead and put this other great big huge circle on there. So I'll come up to Layers, Move Items to Existing Layer, select this big circle, and put it on the Hide Layer. Now you'll note, because the Hide Layer is hidden, it hid the minute that I moved it over there. 
So now we can go back to our draft here and we've got our new circle and we're supposed to be finding where that circle, which is four inches, falls on line three. So we're going to use the intersect again, our circle, line three reference, continue. Again, I've got an extra point up here. I'm just going to get rid of that. And there is our point C. The next point that we're going to be making is point 9, and it is located off of this point C. This is an interesting one because it doesn't use just a full measurement. Let me explain what the instructions said. So from point C, measure off a line to fall somewhere on the guideline 5, equal to the shoulder height measurement less the 4 inch amount just used in locating point C. So basically what they're saying is we want to create a point that is the shoulder height measurement from up here, but we're going to kind of go through this one in the process. Our shoulder height measurement is 349.9 and we know that 4 inches is 101.6 millimeters. So we want a distance of 248.3. So let's add our circle. And now referring back to the instructions, they said on guideline 5. So we'll come down, point at intersection. Now that one Oh, it did. I wouldn't think it would hit, but it hit, so we'll delete it. Okay. If we were to measure from here to here and then here to here, that would equal the shoulder height measurement. Our next point is point 10, and that looks like it's just straight up from point 9. So we can use the point from point tool. And this distance is going to be negative y because we're going up. And the value is going to be the side bodice length, which is 192.3. Now you'll notice that other than that shoulder line, I haven't drawn any lines in. And that's just simply because I can see the pattern outline I've done this so much. You can see the armholes here and we're coming down, down and up and up the neck. And we also have our little illustration. But feel free to add lines as you need them. That doesn't matter at all. You can put whatever geometry on the page that helps you to do a better job. So next we're supposed to draw a line off of point 10 here that comes over and intersects with line 4. So we'll come up and do another reference line. And this is horizontal. And now we can go ahead and put that point D in. And sometimes, you'll notice I had a little trouble selecting that. Just zoom up and it gets easier. And there's our point D. And next, we're supposed to measure up from point B up along the AB line a distance of the bust point height. That's 153.6. So I will select point from point negative 153.6 and there's that. That's point E and point E to point F is one half of the bust point width. That will be 79.7 .7. so we'll do point from point, point F. We're going left so that's negative 79.7 .7. and save. 
So the next point is point G, and the instructions state that we are supposed to go from point B, square a line E to B equal in length to E to F less one half inch, label point G. Essentially, the G point is the same as the E to F less a half inch. So a half inch is 12.7 millimeters, and that means we want to come over from B a distance of 67. So point from point. And there you go. The instructions state that we need to draw a guideline connecting the points G to 9. So I'm just going to come up here and draw a line from G to 9. I'm also going to go ahead and draw a line from B to G. So now we have the waistline of the bodice, but there's a problem with it, obviously, because this waistline is based more on the bust than it is on the waist. So we're already started drawing a dart here, and what we need to do is figure out how much of the waist stays and how much goes into this dart so that it's fitted. Now you saw me use the distance between points tool in the past, but we can measure this entire thing really quickly with another tool, measure line curve. I'm going to select both of these lines and measure them. So the total length right now is 234.59. The full front waist measurement is 324.4, and we need to divide that by 2 because this is only half of the waist. So that's 162.2. So if we subtract the 162.2 waist measurement from the distance we have here, which is the 234.59, that leaves 72.39 millimeters. So now we know what our dart width is. So we'll go ahead and use the circle from this dart leg. And we know the distance is 72.39. And we'll find that intersection. And they're only created one, so we don't have to worry about any deletions. Okay, so what have we done here? We've established the width of the dart. So if we've done this correctly, everything but the dart should be the waist width. So let's come up here and let's measure the distance between these two points, which is 67. And now let's measure the distance between these two points, which is 95.2. And if we add those together, that's the 162.2 that we were looking for. Now we have a dart down here, but it doesn't really look very dart-ish at this point. We need to register it in the fashioner. You always want to register any darts that you create so that you can manipulate them later. And you'll see that as we work. All we need to do is come up to the dart menu and register dart. So it asks for the pivot point of the dart, which is right here at the bust apex. Next it wants to know the dart leg that will stay. Now this might sound a little confusing, but stick with me here. If you've ever worked with a dart on a pattern, you know that you have to fold the dart closed. You're going to bring this point over to this point, and that's how you make the dart. Now the question is, once that's folded, you've got that excess fabric in the back, and where is it going to go? Are you going to press it to the left, or are you going to press it to the right? Now generally, darts are pressed, vertical darts are pressed to the side seams, and horizontal darts are pressed down with gravity. So this is a vertical dart, and this is our side over here. So that means that this point right here isn't going to move. 
But this point right here, we're going to close it over. We're going to bring it to this direction. And now it wants to know which direction are you folding. Well, we're bringing this one over to this one. So this point designates the direction. So basically your direction point will be the point on the other side of the stay point. And I'm going to call this the waist dart. Now, to understand why all that information was necessary, you'll see that the fashioner drew in the dart legs for us, so that'll be very helpful to mark on our pattern if we go to sew this. But you'll notice that we now have this center point. When you, I'm going to save this real quick, when you have darts on a pattern and you go to cut out the pattern, you cannot follow the line across when you cut it out because when the dart is folded, it takes more fabric. And I'm going to show you that here in this little video. You'll see as it folds over that it needs that excess fabric. So the fashioner has taken that information that we gave it. We said, you're folding that way. This leg's staying, this one's coming over. And it did the math to calculate what this extension needs to be. Generally, it is correct. It is not always correct because this is, can be quite confusing, particularly if you're on a curve or something. So when you go to cut out your pattern, go ahead and cut it the way that it's designated and then close the dart, fold it closed, and make sure that that point is where it needs to be. If it isn't, add some additional paper to your draft and fold it over and cut it so that it works out the way that it should. So now we have our dart and you would think that it's done, but it's not. If you recall, when we made the dart legs, we made this leg. It was a specific distance. It matched what we had going over here. And then this one is just this far over, if you will. And dart legs must be the same length. If they're not and you sew them together, you'll get puckering. So this is a common thing that you have to adjust after you've drafted out a dart like this. So the process of fixing it is very simple. We've created a tool. So we'll go to darts and we want to adjust the dart leg. Select the point of the dart leg that's the correct length. This one is the correct length. We want it this long. So I'm going to select that one and continue. Did you see it jump? I'm going to save. So there's where the dart needs to be in order for these two legs to be exactly the same length. And what's interesting, if you look at the little diagram, you'll see that this is indicated in their picture as well. This is point H and you can see that there's a little dotted line and then there's a solid line because their dart leg had to change too. Ours came down, theirs went up, but basically you always need to make that adjustment. Okay, that's it. Believe it or not, that's the entire draft. Now we are ready to start doing some outline work. And I want to hide some of this stuff just so that it's a little bit easier to see as we go along. So I'm going to come up to the layers and move items to existing layer. I want to move the circles and this line all of these reference lines That looks good. So we'll move those to the hide layer. Okay. So now we just have a bunch of points. 
And nothing, recall, nothing is gone. It's all there. It's just hidden at the moment. Now, I don't want to put my outline layer on my draft layer. I would prefer that it goes on the outline layer. So I'm going to come, not in utilities, I'm going to come over to select my active layer and I'm going to switch to the outline layer. Now I want all this stuff here to be on this layer. So I'm going to move it, move items to existing layer. I want this shoulder line, this waistline and these dart legs. And I want to move those to the outline layer and save. Alrighty, now we're ready to do some outline work. The book is using French curves, which are special pattern drafting rulers, if you will, that have nice curves on them for drawing necklines and armholes and such. Obviously, we don't have that ability in here, but we can just use some regular curves to do it. So the first one I want to create here is the neckline, and it starts up here at point 7 and ends at point A over here. And the instructions say that the curve should touch these reference lines as we go down. So I'll come up here to curves, add a curve. I'll start here and end here. And I only want one curve point on this. So there's our curve. Now this is a Bezier curve and this is the curve point and you can see I can pull that curve point and it pulls the curve. That's how Bezier curves work. So I want it to come up against this reference line and on this one and I don't want it to drop below this point 8. That would be bad. So I'm just going to draw it in like that. I think that looks right. So we'll save that. And our next one is for the armhole. And this one's going to take a couple of curve points. It's going to start, I'm going to start it down here at the armpit point, which was point 10. And then it will come up and it will touch the C point and then extend up to here. So let's start with the curve. And I want two curve points on this one. And one thing to keep in mind also, when you create a pattern and then you take it out and you sew it up and you try it on and maybe the curve isn't quite right, make sure to make any adjustments to your pattern, to your paper pattern, and then transfer those back into the program. So the next time that you call up that pattern, it's going to be perfect. As I indicated, armholes and necklines are very difficult to do like this. but as you get more accustomed to the program and how it fits your own body or whomever you're sewing for, you'll know how to make the adjustments work for you. So I'm going to save that. Now I would like to point out that you can add curve points. If you put one on and then you find out, oh, I should have really put two, you can put another point on. You can also come down here after and change the shape of the curve because now I can click on any of these. It doesn't matter which curve and I can adjust. Now I know I haven't gone through all the stuff on this menu. There's tons of things up here. There is a super comprehensive manual for you to use. You can look up anything as you need it. My hope with this video was to go through some processes and show you what I'm using to make those things happen. I'm not going to sit here and just go over stuff because that's really boring to watch and it's pointless. You really need to see in context how these things work. All right, so now we have some nice curves and we need to finish this up. I need the center front line here. So let's draw that next. It just goes from point A to point B. That's a simple one. And now I need to finish this up. I need to come across the dart, 
over to the side point, and then up here to the armpit point. So rather than drawing a bunch of little individual lines, I have the ability to draw a multi-point line, which makes it go a lot faster. But you do need to select the points in order. You can't select them all over the place. So I'll start down here and then just work my way around and continue. Save. Now I should note that this did make individual lines. Each of these lines are separate. It just, I just didn't have to do it one at a time. The program did it for me. So I think this is a great time to talk about saving again. And as I mentioned in the beginning, every time I hit that save button over here, the system saved my work. This is SVG. It's just a bunch of code. If I right click on here and do inspect, There's the SVG container, there's the main layer, there's the canvas, there's the draft, and there's all the points, all the information is here. So it's just code. And so every time you hit save, we save all that code. This gives you the ability to step backwards at any time. I can do step back, see the line disappear, it also keeps track of the zooming and such, so I can go back all the way to the very first point that was created. Even if my browser crashes, I will always have that history. Now I'm going to do something that would be terrifying in most any other program, even though I just got rid of that line. I'm going to go out of here. I'm not hitting anything, any saves, and go to my account. Down here on my Fashioner session, you can see that we have the one we were working on. And I can just click this edit, and there it is. There is one other option that you have on the menu, and that's referred to as Save State. When you create a sloper or basic block like we have done here, you might find that it's a good time to save it in its current state. In other words, this is a great starting point for other things in the future. You can do that with the file save state. So I'm going to save this. It asks for a name. I'm going to say this is the basic block state. And I'm going to save that. Now I want you to watch something. This is our file name over here. Now watch as I save this. Notice that nothing changed. We saved a copy of this and all its history over to our account, but we're still on the same project. Anything we do from this point forward continues to be saved to this project. So save state just saves it as it is with all its history in its current state. So let's verify that. I'm just going to come up here and I'm going to add a free point. Let's put it right in the dart. Now let's go back and let's open that state. No dot, but everything else is here. Now we can go ahead and come over here and come back to our original and there's the point. So now you get an idea of how that works. So we built this system so that you can be confident that you won't lose any of your work. Even if there's some type of error that the cancel button doesn't eliminate or you have a total system crash, you can always get back your project by using those fashioner sessions. Now if we wanted to sew this pattern in the real world, we would need some seam allowances. So first of all, I'm going to get rid of that funny little point I put on here. And we can come up here and do seam allowances automatically with the utility menu, add seam allowance. Now before I do this, I should mention, you'll see there's a set seam allowance value as well. So seam allowance values are set by the program. It's one of the variables that was available when we came through the fashioner. 
if for some reason you want to change the seam allowance on any item that's in here, you can do so by using the set seam allowance value tool. So I can select this line and it says right now the seam allowance is going to be 12, which is about a half an inch. And if you wanted it to be something else, you could just change it and that would set the seam allowance on that line. Now this gives you the ability to set different values at different places on the draft. If you're a beginner and you don't have a lot of experience with sewing, leave them all the same. You can always trim them back and it'll be less confusing. If you're quite familiar and you decide, you know, I just, on my collars, I want a quarter inch on, on my necklines and I want something less on the armholes, you can change any of it. Just remember that if it's a mating pattern, so if you change this to a quarter inch, make sure that you fix your collar as well or you're going to have a real mess on your hands. But you do have that ability. All right, so let's go back and let's add a seam allowance. So we need to select the lines and curves that create a closed shape. The seam allowance tool will not work unless you have a completely enclosed shape. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to select all of these all the way around. See how it's completely closed and that's necessary. And then I just hit continue. Sometimes when it draws a seam allowance, depending on how the pattern was done, the seam allowance will go to the inside. I'll show you. It'll look like that. If that happens, just hit the button and it'll take it to the other side. So we'll save that. Now if I want to, I can come up here and hide the drafting layer. Let me show you what happens. You'll see that the curve points are still here and there's a reason for this. If you recall, the curve points belong to the curve and they have to be on the same layer or it wouldn't work at all. So you have a couple of options. One thing you can do with a curve is you can turn it into a line and it's called a polyline. And what it will do is it will take off your ability to manipulate the curve. You're going to lose those curved points, but it makes the line hold and it'll look just like this, except it won't have any points on it. So it's up to you. Uh, if you want your patterns printed out without those points showing, then go ahead and convert those over to lines. So this is completely done. There's some other things if you wanted to, you could add some instructions to it with some text. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's do uh, text between points and let's put it right here. So. I'll select those two points and now we can put in whatever we want. I'm going to say this is um, modern pattern design, grace, front bodice. It's really huge. We don't need it that big. And then maybe I'll add another line here and I'll just put today's date. So you can add whatever information you want. We could also, let's do one more, and let's put it that uh, we need to cut two. This is only half. So you can put instructions for cutting or whatever you want here. So I'll save that. And now our pattern is done. Now I'd like to take it over to MD and show you how it fits, but this is just the front. <laughs> you need a back pattern to do that. Luckily, I've gone ahead and made that back pattern. Let me show you how that looks. And that's how that pattern turned out using the same instructions, the same book. Let me show you the draft layer. 
There's all the geometry that went into it. If you're interested in watching me draft this pattern as a companion in another video, please put a comment down below and I can do that for you. Now everything's ready to export out of the fashioner and we have a couple of options for output and they're up here under the file menu. We can export as a PDF or we can export as a PNG. Now a PDF will create multiple pages either 8.5 by 11 or A4, whatever your choice is, that you would then glue or tape together to create your pattern. The PNG is just simply a image file that you can use in other 3D programs like Marvelous Designer. Before you output anything, you need to take a look at what you've got displayed here on the canvas. This is what will be output. And if you have long lines like guidelines or circles that are far outside the pattern area, the system will either not generate the output or it will just hang for a very long time drawing it. As you can see, these go on pretty much to infinity and it results in huge file sizes. So make sure that you hide those things. You don't have to delete them. If they are hidden, they will not be included in the output. If I wanted to take this out as a PNG for use in Marvelous Designer, I could just come up to the layers and move items to existing layers. And I'm gonna select these reference lines and um, the seam allowance as well. And put those on the hidden layer. Now I have a very nice, smaller <laughs> area for output. Sometimes, depending on how large your pattern is, it could take just a moment for the system to create the output files. It's not instantaneous, so give it a bit of time. Don't be impatient. Here are the front and back patterns sewn up in MD. And MD has some fitting tools that I can turn on over here and you can see the fit. Uh, the blue means it fits really well. If there were any tight areas, it would be red. Any of you familiar with MD know that you can have a garment that fits horribly <laughs> and it still looks fine, but it wouldn't with these on, it would be bright red. So this fits Grace just the way that it should. And it also highlights the fact that if you're drafting patterns to your own measurements, that you can be confident that you'll get this type of fit as well. Now that you've seen how easy it is to draft a pattern from nothing, you can use any pattern resource in the fashioner and create patterns like this for yourself. Of course, you don't have to start from scratch. You can use any of the patterns available in the fashioner catalog as a starting point. Now that we have a perfectly fitted sloper, our design process begins from here, and we can be confident that whatever design choices we make will result in a garment that fits Grace this well. Next, I'd like to introduce you to some design concepts that I think you'll find really useful. As you recall, we save the state of the pattern to use as a basis for designs. And here I am in my fashioner sessions, and you can see that I've created three different states off that main pattern for us to play around with here for using darts. Darts can be moved from one position to another position without changing the fit of the garment. So right now, this is our rotation point or pivot point for the dart. And we could move this dart intake over here, over here, up here, literally anywhere. We could put it in the armhole. This is one of the things that you can do with darts. We're going to move this waist dart from the waist, obviously, over here to the side. And we have a dart tool to do that. I should explain that PatternMaker Pro is based on the slash and spread method of pattern manipulation. If you were doing this with paper, it would look like this. You would slash the pattern at a new point over to the existing pivot point, and then you would slash the existing dart on the dart leg. Then you would rotate the pattern over, transferring all or part of the existing dart to the new dart. So to do that, 
in the fashioner, we need to create our point over here. And I'm going to create the point on the line. So I'm going to select points and add a point on a line and select this line. And I want this point on the line. You'll note that I have the option to go beyond the line, which would mean the point could come off the end and still retain the vector of the line. And now I have a slider that I can use to move that point up and down the line, or I can add precise measurements from the start and end. I can also offset it, put the point over here or over here if I wanted to. But I do want this on the line, and I'm going to just use the slider because I'd like to have it about the same level that I have here on the bust apex. So I'll save that. And now I go up here to the dart menu, and what I want to do is move a dart. So it's asking which dart would you like to move. I have my waste dart here because it was registered in the system, so I'm going to say the waste dart. How much of the dart do you want to close? You don't have to move all of the dart. You can move part of it. But in this case, we're going to close all of it. This is a percentage, so you enter 100 for 100% 100 of it to be moved. And continue. Now it asks for me to select the slash point first, and then all the points around ending with the first leg of the existing dart. So here's the slash point. I want this point to move with the rotation, and here's the first leg of the dart, and continue. Now you can see what it did. It rotated that closed, and in the process it opened up a new dart here on the side. So we'll save that. Here's the finished bodice with the side dart on Grace. You can see we didn't lose any of our fit. I think this is a good time to point out that the reason why this is so incredibly easy to do in the fashioner is because of the registration of the dart. You told the fashioner how the dart's constructed, which way it closes, and it keeps that information available to use when you want to move it somewhere else. So that's why it's so easy to do this type of a process. Now for our next dart, I'd like to go ahead and bring it up to the shoulder. We're only going to take 50% of the dart in the process, but let's take a look at something that might be an issue, and that's this curve. As you know, when you are selecting items that are going to rotate, this curve would be included because you're going to come down like this. As I mentioned previously, you don't really want to be messing with moving curve points because the curve shape will change on you. So what we need to do is we need to make this curve permanent and take these curve points off. And we can do that by selecting curves, curve to line, and then I'll select the curve. Now we have a couple of options. We can keep the curve shape, which means it'll look like this, or we can straighten it, which would mean it would hold on to the start and end points and all the curve points would be removed. It would be a straight line. So we're going to keep the shape, and there it is, and we'll save that. Now what it's done is it has created a polyline, which means that there's just a whole bunch of little tiny lines all the way around, but this allows it to be a rigid form and you can no longer change the shape. This is perfect for our dart. So now we're ready to go ahead and do this dart. The first thing we need to do is create a slash point for it. So I'm going to go up here and select uh, add a point on the line. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't want to select. Okay, so what we want to be on the line. And now we have a slider and we can also enter exact values. So I'm going to leave it right where it's at. I want it right in the middle. So I'll save that. And now we're ready to go ahead and do the dart. Now I would like to point out one thing. You notice that I did put this point here on this line, which means this line has been split into two pieces, if you will. There are actually two lines here now. And when we do this process, 
this will come down and then it'll rotate and this line will rotate. It'll come over and this one will stay. We could have just done a free point and thrown it up here and done the whole process and it, it would have worked, but this line would have just been left it, or it would have been resized. Anyway, it wouldn't have looked correct. When you're going to be doing things with darts or fullness, I would suggest that you make sure that the points actually are on the lines and the lines have been split. So let's come up here to move dart, the waist dart, 50%. We're going to select the slash point and then the points around ending with the first leg. So I'm going to take this. I don't need these. I just need the start and the end for this polyline to move properly. And there's the first leg. Continue. And save. So there you go. It took 50% of this dart and moved it up here into the shoulder. Now one thing that I should point out is that you can see that right here, if you were to measure, well, let's do that. We can. The distance between that is 37.27. So that's half of the original dart. So now if we measure this, it's 59. So you might think, well, that's not right. It moved way too much up there but you have to take into consideration the length of this dart. So if you were able to measure this distance up here and then you measured it, it would match. But because the dart is so much longer, that's why it's spread farther apart. So I just wanted to clear that up just in case you were wondering. So let's take this out and see how it looks. So here's Grace in that new revised sloper and you can see that there's the shoulder dart and the waist dart coming together and it does look a little bit strange right here because there is a point where they're kind of on top of each other and it's creating strangeness <laughs> so you wouldn't really want to do this what you would want to do is to create two separate pieces which is like a princess seam if you're familiar with that term so let's do that. Let's turn this into a nice princess seam. We'll go ahead and come up here to curves and we'll add a curve. Let's start right here and end here. And I'm not sure. I probably want a couple curve points for this. And I'll bring it over. make a nice smooth curve out of it. And let's save that. And now let's go up and create another curve for the other side. Now, one thing with these curves is we would want to make sure that they are the same length. So I'm going to come up and take a look at that, see what we have here. So this is 402 and I didn't mean to do that. Let's deselect this one. And this is 401.85. So that's within a millimeter. These should sew together just fine. But when you do things like this, you'll want to pay attention always to mating patterns. Make sure that the uh, two sides are very close to each other. So let's take that over and see how it looks now. So here's Grace with the princess seam. And I threw a little piping on there just so that it would accentuate the seam so you could see. And it looks really nice. 
So what we have now with the front is these are completely separate pieces. There are two pieces now for each side. For our final dart manipulation, we're going to have three darts replace this one dart. And I want them up right here in the front. Now before we put those points in for the slashes, we need to remember that this point right here, when we drew it, it's not connected to a line. If you recall, when we did the outline, we started up here and down here, the center front was just one single line. This point had nothing to do with it. And we can actually tell that by going up here and selecting properties. And I'm going to select this point and show the properties. And what this does is it shows you, it's kind of like that right click inspect thing I showed you a while ago. This shows you the properties of this SVG item. And there are some unique properties that I put on these SVG geometry objects for reference in the fashioner. One of those things is something called data line or data curve. And if a point is part of a line or a curve, you'll see that on here. And you can see the only thing that we have is this data group, which tells you it's on the draft layer. So let's pick one of these other points and you'll see what I'm talking about. Right here it says data line. So this line, one of them, is number 136 and the other one is 148. It's telling you this point is part of those lines. And this guy doesn't have any lines. So we can be pretty confident that he's not involved. So what that means is that when we go to split this line or add points to it, this thing is pretty irrelevant. It's there, but it really has nothing to do with splitting this line up. And I'm sorry if that was a little confusing, but it's important that you understand that if you've connected a line to a point, that connection matters. And it becomes part of the line or the curve that it's connected to and how the fashioner behaves will change if a point is just floating around by itself or if it's actually part of a line. Because if you move a point that's attached to a line, then the fashioner knows that. And let's do that real quick just so that you can see what I'm talking about. Let's move this point right down here. Let's move it over and up. Did you see? The lines redrew because they're connected. This also points out that that point's not on it. So I'm going to cancel this out. So now we've established that this is a complete line from start to end and we want to split it up with slash points for this dart. Let's put some points on our line. And I think I'll put the first point, I think maybe right, maybe a little higher than that. Oops. That looks good. And I'm going to save it. Now, if you remember, that just split this line. There's two lines now. And I'm going to get rid of this point just because it's causing me annoyance. <laughs> So move items to the hide layer. Okay, let's add another point now. And I'm going to move this up right about there. And now we have three lines. Every time we made a point, it split the line. And this one, I'm going to leave it right in the middle so those are evenly divided. Okay, I have all my slash points now. Now what I want to do is transfer all of this dart to these. So we'll come up here, move dart to multiple, 
select a dart waste. I want to move all of it. Select one or more slash points. You can have as many as you like. So you'll notice when I went to click this point, I got two choices. And the reason for that is that the fashioner looks at points and if they're stacked on top of each other, it wants to make sure that you select the correct one. Now, if I hover over this one, you'll see this is the one on the current layer. And this one, you can't see anything, and that's because it's on that hidden layer. But the fashioner still knows that it's there, and it's going to give you the option of selecting it, which we don't want to do. But that's what that means. So sometimes when you go to select a point, it's going to ask, which one did you want? Because these are really close to each other. So we're going to take this one. And now we'll take that last one. Our slashes have all turned blue. And now we want to select the points to move, ending with the first leg of the existing dart. Now you'll recall when we were just doing one slash, we had to choose the slash. But this is a completely different set at this point. So we're just going to start with what we want to move all the way to the first leg. Continue. And there you go. The dart's been closed, and all of it has been transferred evenly between these three. So let's have a look at that in MD. And here are our multiple darts. You can see this is a dart cluster that we've created in the front. And I think the most important thing to point out is that it still fits. I mean, it's still completely tailored to her body because we didn't really change anything. We moved where the dart was. It was down here, but it doesn't matter because the dart values weren't changed. They were just moved to a different location. It still fits perfectly. I'm afraid this video has gone on long enough. You should have enough information now to draft patterns based on any books that you might have. We briefly touched on the power of the dart tool and dart manipulation too. There's so much more within the fashioner that I can't wait to share with you. I'll be making many more videos showing you all kinds of design possibilities. Thank you for watching, and please let me know in the comments what type of pattern modifications you'd like to see in the future.